you want to save costs on your manufacturing process. Now, the most common place we start to look is at the machine tools, at the tooling, at the work holding, at the fixturing. But what if I told you your engineering could be the reason you are hemorrhaging money in your operations, and that is the biggest barrier you have. My guest today on Machine Shop Tech Talk, Jonathan Boyer. He is a mechanical engineer with several patents. So we start to look at some of the hidden costs of the failed and poor design practices and a lot of other keen insights he's developed over the last couple decades. Let's get into it. Welcome, Jonathan. I am excited to dig into the topic today with you. I know we were talking about gd and and everything, but really the wastes that are created with bad design yes. and the obstacles that presents to bringing more work to North America. And I wanted to dig into that with you today. Sounds good. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. So let's let's look at some of the wastes we were talking about. What are some of the wastes you see? So my focus is in mechanical engineering and manufacturing, uh, working closely with machinists and manufacturers. And I'm a heavy mechanical mechanisms designer for particularly mass production. You're thinking about how do we produce this thing on a large scale? Tolerances, is it manufacturable? All that development work that goes on, wastes we see in that are people not even understanding what business they're in. Engineers hmm. lacking the leadership inside a department, a point person who's not a manager, a leader who's not a manager that is telling them what they should be doing, um, and managers not even knowing they need someone like that on their team. Um, so I guess let's start there, you know, at the top. Managers mm -hmm. not realizing the gap and what's going on. Yeah, I do think, um, and I see it on the machine tool and the cutting tool side, as well as the design side in manufacturing right now, is there's, there's a lot of, of ignorance that we can shed some light on. And I don't mean to, to dirty anyone's no. name by saying they're ignorant. It, it's not a slight, it's just... There's a lot of stuff we don't know and we don't know that we don't know. So we go to work on the things we do know we don't know. Mm -hmm. And then we get lost. Like you said, we don't even know what business we're in with the way that it actually comes out, like the what we're working on. Yeah. Right. It just looks like we have no idea what's going on. Yeah, there's a lot of frustration. I, you know, I've I've mentor a lot of engineers across different industries and I see mm -hmm. this all the time with if you're in the commodity business, you know, in small injection molded parts, maybe it's games or toys or maybe it's home use products like engineers not being paid enough. Um, so they move to a different industry and then they don't have the skills in aerospace. And it's like, yeah, see, it's it's a different game when you move from commodities to mechanisms that have to work reliably across different temperature ranges, conditions, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we have to draw a line in our conversation of who we're really talking about here because not all engineering industries are created the same, um, even though maybe you finance the way you do finance, the way you do the business side of things, it looks similar, maybe. The engineer, the quality of the engineer is different. So any engineers listening to this right now, you have to ask yourself, <laughs> what quality engineer are you? And this isn't to belittle anyone. This is to say, to really self-evaluate, what business are you in and what type of engineer do you want to be? Yeah, and I think that's a good point, especially when you're talking about you know, engineering for manufacturability. If, if you're looking to engineer products that, that are going to be, like you said, a commodity, um, it doesn't make sense to be in the aerospace where it's a, there's a lot of technical details yes. that are necessary for that. There's a lot more, uh, rigor requ required in the design of a latch in aerospace than there is for a kid's toy. Yes. That, that's, let's just be real. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, so that's really where the, the, why these industries engineers make more money because you can hire a person right out of high school, probably with maybe a CAD certificate to model their ideas and 3D print something and one-offs look good and they call themselves engineer, an engineer air quotes. When you're thinking on a fundamental basis, when someone could die, patients and, and medical could be hurt, you've really got to look at engineering and at applying physics and variation. 
And that's really my big message here to leaders of companies. If you're listening to this Mm -hmm. and you're a manager, director, leader, first of all, thank you for taking the time to listen, but also the questions of, are you aware that this is what, if you're in the industry of where where maybe it's medical, maybe it's robotics, maybe it's aerospace, people could get hurt. You're, you know, even automotive. Are your engineers working on the right things? Are they understanding the physics? Are they understanding variation? Are they bringing those two things together before they go off and prototype something that they want really bad? They want this thing to do the thing they are. They're imposing their will on this thing, this mechanism. I had this idea in the shower or on the drive home, and I'm going to prototype it because I really want this thing to do this thing. And it's like, well, you need. have you done the analysis to see that with variation your th- idea will actually work? And that's that's a great point. And the other side of that too, um, like when you're talking about imposing will, one of the things I flash back to is all my time on the shop floor and I'd get a print that was so tightly over toleranced that, you know, I've got extra setup time. Yeah. I have a machinist background, right? So I've got extra setup time. I've got extra cost in tooling. Now I'm changing my tools more because I've got to hold a certain finish or a certain positional tolerance. All of these other barriers to get the part manufactured so it could go be assembled for its final utilization. And all because the engineer decided everything needed, you know, a half tenth or better for positional, a half tenth or better for size when the assembly didn't require it, the so, end use didn't require it, but the engineer just didn't want the part to fail. So all they did was slap bigger, to- tighter tolerances on I it. I see that all the time. And I see, I don't know if this is true for everyone, but one thing rings true for me when I, for all the different examples I've seen is we're, we're really making a distinction here in this conversation between early phase development and or sorry, early phase research and then later phase development. Yeah. I am not talking about early research. Early research is messy and you spend a lot of money trying to figure out what this thing should be. I'm talking about development on the backside and there's when you switch over to that, there's a potential for waste, and most people fall into the trap. Um, and it has to do with business incentives and stuff, uh, where like you do a dog and pony show for your idea, your prototype that you've done sketches on, that you've you know worked to collect requirements on, and the business people like what they see and they fund your project. Right? That's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. But they want what they saw now (laughs) the problem is the engineers they probably didn't have maybe they were under source under resourced to do this project to begin with and they didn't have like a lead engineer chief engineer that could say hang on guys here are the principles of design this type of mechanism is sensitive in this way this type of mechanism is sensitive in that way leading the discussion so that you don't just make impose your will on something win the business and now you can't produce so this is the problem i'm talking about on the back end um they that's where the tight tolerances come from they say oh shoot we actually have to make this thing work and they just launch the product they work and then they don't they didn't do the analysis so they make everything tight um and it really goes back to the very beginning not understanding what business you're in not understanding who you need on the team not understanding what competencies you need. And the only way you can do, you know, you could say a f- team could naturally form and have those people. And I could show you example after example of companies that have let teams naturally form and most of them fail. But the ones that w- succeed, why do they succeed? No one knows. Well, if you look at the teams just by random chance, they had a person an expert, a chief level engineer on the team usually that says to their engineers, takes a mentorship mindset and really helps everyone understand the fundamentals behind everything. So it's just like this dance that's going on. Um, So, but if you're a leader of a company and you say, how do I get that organic team to form? Don't wait around. You could do it now (laughs) by understanding what the gap is educating yourself on what's needed and informing those teams now 
Yeah, well, and I, I think our conversation here is going to go a long way. So if you're listening and you, you're not a leader, but you know a leader that could benefit from listening to everything Jonathan's sharing here, please do share this with him because this is about forwarding the conversation, about bringing more work to North America, to yes. to improving the flow, to supporting companies that had that beautiful boardroom idea, but they didn't have their team set up with a lead engineer that could guide the conversation to, to set realistic expectations. This is a great conversation to that effect. Just when you're talking about companies that kind of wait for that organic mm -hmm. thing to, to set up there, because you see it all through manufacturing, right? I know we're talking about design and, and the waste in the design today, but it happens, well, with a lot of companies, they happen to get the right people. They happen to organize themselves and they're the small percentage that are successful. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone else is pulling out their hair, trying to get cheaper tools, cheaper material, cheaper engineers on their team yep. because they want to try to compete and they're just missing those key leaders and mentors in their business. Then you get that high employee turnover. You lose your customers. You, you have to start turning away work because you just can't figure out how to manufacture it at a cost that makes sense you know and and then we end up with more shore work going offshore <laughs> it's connected into that for sure you know we were talking earlier about if i was a leader of a company a business person like a director i would be thinking what are the future needs you know we've got automation threatening and robotics and ai threatening losing taking people's jobs but what are the opportunities on the horizon and mm -hmm. you know you, we could just go through so many of them right there's uh, aerospace and uh, space flight stuff there is energy there is mining of yeah. renewable materials or precious metals there is recycling yeah. of you know what do we do with waste what are the opportunities there um, this is like s endless jobs I just highlighted. I believe they're endless jobs. Yeah. Um, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, chemical engineers. Um, but these problems and these problems will change the world. These problems will make our lives. Or sorry, these solutions to the problems will change the world and change and make our, all our lives better. Who's going to do that work? It requires people who have the mindset to gain the competencies and the technical skill and do the hard work. And that's all connected to what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, this early phase development stuff, thinking through the physics, the fundamental physics, plotting that all out with variation, and then you're ready to hit the ground running into manufacturing. That model is transferable and it applies to all the different industries we're talking about because you cannot solve technical problems without doing that. No, and and it comes like like we keep coming back to the the mentorship side of things is so integral in engineering. I know I've worked at a couple companies that were you know thankful enough that they had an engineer that had been in the industry for fifteen to twenty years on critical product design. You know, considering all these factors you're talking about, I've also worked at companies where their highest skilled person was more of a draftsman than an engineer. That's very um, common. <laughs> Those are yeah, very so valuable people. That's a whole nother topic we yeah. get into. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, I don't want to sidetrack it, but yeah. it, it's when we're looking at all of those sectors and we're looking at all of those things, the, the common threads when it comes to design and, and really, you know, you're talking about robotics taking work. The reality is, is there's more open jobs than people looking for work right now in North America. Isn't that amazing? So at, it, the more robots and automation we can bring in, the better our countries are going to thrive because right now we have a lack of employment issue, like a, a, a lack of workers, sorry, available for the amount of work that we need to get done. And crazy guys like you and me, we're intent on bringing more work to this continent. Yeah. So we really need to figure yeah. out the automation I, side. I'm seeing, <laughs> I'm seeing people... I need people on my team that are passionate about thinking, um, not passionate yeah. about turning, making bigger rock, a smaller rocks out of bigger rocks, you know, turning the crank on something. Yeah. We can automate that. We can AI it. We can robot it. You know, 
Um, yeah. We need people who are comfortable with doing the real work, which is going in a room and thinking. No one wants mm -hmm. to do that. It seems like that seems like that really hurts people's brains these days is to think it's a lost skill. It's a spiritual experience for me. You know, I've des I've gotten uh, yeah. several patents out of the thinking process. Just being by myself for, say, three hours straight in a room by myself and just thinking. It hurts. Mm -hmm. It's uncomfortable. But then you realize these if you boil it back down to the fundamental principles and you're plotting the physics and you're like, okay, is my mechanism going to work across this range? It takes a lot of tolerance analysis, yada, yada. I don't want to bore people. But mm -hmm. that right there is what's going to solve the problems that we face in the future. Yeah. Well, and it's creative thinking. It's not, it's not like just refining a thought like through AI because there is some AI for engineering, yeah. but this is more of a creative thinking, putting things together that wouldn't be put together by a large language model. Uh, I just want to make that distinct for the listeners. Yeah. They might be like, yeah, but there's, there's AI that works on engineering now. Mm. They can, they can design parts. It's not this, that's not what we're pointing to here. Maybe with the combination of the uh, Wolfram uh, math language and AI um, large language models. That's still mm -hmm. new yet. They're still trying to figure that out, but they've started that I could foresee being very powerful. But you still have to think through top level requirements. What in the natural world meet those top level requirements, physics based stuff, then natural variation because you're producing this stuff with imperfect machines across you know multiple processes and you know all the tolerance associated with that right there i just made anyone's listening to me right now that runs a company i just made you a bunch of money if you can absorb what i just said <laughs> yeah and that was free advice and i hope people go back and listen to what i just said because you know what i'm saying right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're fundamentals that are going to save companies a lot of money if they listen. And it's I know we're we're getting into it, but it's it's really like, OK, we, we've kind of highlighted the problems. Right. And we, we've highlighted what's necessary, you know, taking that three hours, thinking through getting, you know, all the work you've put in on the thinking side. But like you also mentioned, there, there seems to be a hesitancy to that, taking that time, um, whether it's people's desire to look productive or be effective or some other label slapped on there. I don't know there. what it is, but I'll just say right now, I'm gonna, I give all engineers permission listening to this right now. I don't know if you need to hear this from someone, but I give you permission to do this, to go and think. <laughs> and you are, if you have a mechanical engineering degree, you are fully capable. You have everything you need to go make amazing designs. It just, you've got to be comfortable being alone and slugging through the analysis. I promise you, mm. you will learn something and your company, if you do this enough, your company will start seeing you as an expert in this and you'll career, your career will take off. That Now, that if that's what you want from your career, you know, I'm just yeah. saying this conversation's around solving technical problems. So Let, let's look at the, because we were talking about the, the need for that leadership and the mentorship when you're engineering and you've got, whether it's a, a machine shop or an OEM or a design firm, engineering firm, right? Whatever it is, there needs to be that, that mentor that can advise and guide and support and direct the team and set reasonable expectations. Now, obviously, I mean, you could, you could hire that person. However, they, they've been very few and far between in my 22 years in manufacturing to find that raw talent just happening out there. And usually when you find them, the companies that have them know what they have. Yeah. And they've slapped some golden handcuffs on there, so yeah. they're not going anywhere. Okay, so um, we can create a bunch of experts right now based off what I just yeah. said before. Um, yeah. They, there are some really smart people, high IQ, high functioning, high um, – you know, the combination of like high IQ and high um, ex being able to execute, you know, like an Elon, yeah. Elon Musk type of person, they, they're unstoppable. That yeah. is the, the far in, in few in between you were mentioning. But anyone can make themselves an expert by doing the hard work. Um, maybe you're not the smartest person in the room, but... If you dedicate yourself to thinking through the physics with variation and then thinking through how to, you know, really what I'm talking about, I don't want to get into in the weeds here, 
I'm talking about no, no. free body diagrams. I'm talking about tolerance analysis, like understanding GD and T. How do those two things go together? That's what I teach. I teach how to marry your physics with your variation. All of that you can understand now it, within, I don't know, a matter of a year if you dedicate yourself to it you'll explode in your ability to design uh, mechanisms that are mass producible. Um, and you'll, your confidence will soar because you know, you know what you know. You, then you made yourself an expert internally and then you, you're on your way career track to becoming a highly valuable employee in the company. Um, but companies are not putting that expectation on their engineering departments. I really, really think that's directors and above VPs, presidents, really need to be aware of this stuff and putting that level of expectation on the uh, lower level, you know, uh, boots on the ground, I call them. Well, yeah, and I think there's there's some questions for the owners and the leaders that are listening right now that you could ask yourself, ask your team and go back with. I'll start with a couple and then if you have any that come to mind, Jonathan, but it's like, you know, when we're, if you currently design here in the USA or in Canada, and you're getting your work made overseas, how much of the troubleshooting and the design refinements happening when you send it over versus having a good product here? I firmly believe having a, a good product here makes it manufacturable here. And, and there's a lot of hidden, almost like a hidden salvation in offshoring all that expertise to get it manufacturable. Mm -hmm. Another one would be to look at your tolerancing protocols that your engineers use. I don't want to dig into too much of it here, but are your engineers the type that are just over tolerancing everything? Does it even matter for the final assembly or the final use case of they your They might part? not know the um, answer. No one, it's hard to know the answer to that because, you know, directors That's fair. tend to just trust their engineering. Well, you don't want to, as a director, you don't want to overstep your managing teams, right? That would be counterproductive. True. But it might be worth a question asking your managing teams, like, uh, just I'm just curious, like, how do you guys go about yeah. analyzing if something's ready to be done? Um, if you're hearing, yeah. you need to be hearing things. I'm going to give a key to any uh, president, VP, director level, even CEO. Yeah. Obviously, you know how to run your company. All I'm saying is you should be listening for t terms like physics and variation. If you're not hearing physics and variation, something's not right. You need a mechanical engineer on your team who is an advocate, a preacher of this stuff. If they don't exist on your team, if no one's doing this, you're probably wasting a lot of money. You know, stuff's going out the door that it wasn't producible to begin with. And then you're spending money to make it producible. And then all that money, then everything that could have been understood on the front end is being understood on the back end and with 10x cost associated with it, maybe more. That's a good point. And I know we met actually because of the video you put up about your GD and T, the way you were explaining the fit and the tolerance and that's how we ended up here. Yep. So for, you know, Jonathan, for the, the leaders and, and the VPs, the CEOs, the ones that are running the company that are watching this right now, if they're like, okay, I don't know. And, or they realize, okay, you know what? I don't think I have a strong leader. I'm not getting a lot of feedback. I'm not hearing about variation in physics from my guys. What, what can we do to support them? I know that you are super passionate about this. Maybe share a little bit about the passion and where it's got you, what, you, what you're up to right now. Yeah, so over my career, I've discovered this. No one taught this to me other than I go back to Dr. Kyle from Western Michigan University, my favorite professor, shout out. He runs the CAD group <laughs> over there. He um, one day told me, if you haven't done the free body diagram, you don't understand your design. And that bothered me a lot. And then I don't know when I realized he, how right he was in my career when I'm trying to design something for medical industry that could, like if we're not within a tolerance zone, we could kill the patient. And I one day just stopped imposing my will on this mechanism. And I just was like, I'm going to pull all geometry out of my head, like not think about geometry. And I'm just going to do stick figure, napkin sketch, physics, free body diagrams, forces, moments, where are the reaction loads going. And I'm going to design a physic, 
complex system that resolves all the problems I need virtually to keep the patient safe. I arrived to a solution, theoretical solution, and it was just lines, mm -hmm. vectors, you know, not trying to get too technical. I just want people to realize yeah. this is what engineers need to be doing, mechanical engineers need to be doing in these types of industries. Then I said, okay, this physics model gives me what I need. How do I put skin on those bones for physical geometry? So I started designing and almost Im out of the ether came several patents out of that. I, I, hmm. Yeah, my name is on them, but I almost feel like they're not my design because I plotted the physics and I let Mother Nature tell me what the geometry should look like. But not only that, hmm. I did variation. Okay, what if I'm a little bit this way? What if I'm a little bit that way? Thinking about downline processes. And then I had to totally yeah. start over and redo my mechanism. My mechanism was too sensitive to tolerance, to variation. Mm. So I came up with a design yeah. that was insensitive to variation, as insensitive as I could get, can't be perfect. And then I had a patentable mechanism that kept the patient safe. Then I realized I just discovered something. I discovered mechanical engineering. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> that is how you should be designing all your mechanisms i don't care what industry you're in now if you're in the i we made it in the very beginning of this podcast we made a distinction between different yeah, yeah you know like if you're in the uh, commodity business that's totally different i'm talking about high risk industries so you mentioned my gd and t thing out of that yeah. big realization i this was several years ago i've been relentless at pursuing that's why I say it's like a spiritual ex uh, experience for me. I've been pursuing this model yeah. and I've been refining it and I've realized I had a gap. I had a GD and T gap. Just a buzzword for leaders listening. Geometric dimension tolerancing. It's, you, I'm sure you've heard it. Um, so I started working on how to get gain these sticking note insights from mechanical engineers. Whenever you're designing a mechanism like this, think of this relationship. Whenever you need this, think of that relationship. They're just mathematical relationships that help you design geometry. And all of that is extracted out of the gd &T principles. So when you're designing a mm -hmm. mechanism, you know right off the bat how you're going to put gd &T on that print. And it's tied to all your analysis. Everything's linked. So that's, that's what my spreadsheet that I showed online does. It's part of a curriculum. It's part of a, sesh, a workshop session that I run. Pe mechanical engineers and machinists, I run this through. So, yeah. Well, and it looks like a, a great program. I know the spreadsheet when you were sharing about it, it's, I've never seen anyone illustrate it in in such an easy-to-understand way. Like, I reshared it right away. Yes, thank like, you. you know, people need to see how simple this it is. It really is simple, um, guys. Um, I don't, the GD&T yeah. that I learned boggled my brain. Mm not ashamed to admit it i think for years i pretended to know gd and t because i'm an, a mechanical engineer i know gd and t right and then yeah. when i stumbled across this method that i just explained with plotting variation with the physics and all that um, i realized yeah. i didn't actually know gd and t i knew all the rules to gd and t um, but i couldn't explain to you for example why profile tolerance is doesn't allow a material modifier i knew it doesn't mm -hmm. and i knew the definition out of the standard why it doesn't because it's fundamentally a surface control but why and now i know exactly why and i can show how you can convert between position and profile back and forth back and forth i can show how you when you would use mmc when you would use lmc why you would use rfs i can show the whole range in the spreadsheet i posted that you reposted explains all of that with a very simple graph um, because it's just geometry. It's just how yeah. 3D space relates to e to itself, to each point to itself. Um, anyway, that's a quick example yeah. of <laughs> explanation, I guess. Well, and to anyone that wants to see that original one, I'll just link it below the video so you can go click and check it out. I do recommend for the more technical people uh, it's definitely a way more technical conversation than we're having here today. Yeah. When, you know, when also, I know you've got your training and everything, but when we're looking, you know, let's say the company, the, the presidents, the owners, they've identified, okay, I don't really, I don't really know, or 
I want to get training for my guys. They could go to they could go to a vocational institute, mm-hmm. maybe get another level of programming or specialization. They could go to university or college or something, some other post secondary institution. They could do they could develop their own in house programs. You know, I've done that for simple stuff like blueprint comprehension. So it's always an option. Or, and something that I'm seeing trending in a lot of areas is, is going to online resources. Yep. And the main thing there, and the, the reason like why I personally sign up for a lot of programs is more of that mentoring, that one-on-one option, smaller class sizes, where I have that ongoing support. Because when we're talking about almost like a, a conceptual or a paradigm shift for when it comes to thought, that mentorship is invaluable especially in the case of engineering when you're going to have people in school maybe like yourself oh I, i'm a mechanical engineer i know gd and t you've got that mindset maybe they're not a, a, as willing to be flexible as you let have me, been with your mindset let me put it this but, way you've ever been yeah. listening to someone and they're clearly smarter than you like a, maybe it's a motivational speaker but they have a way of explaining something that makes you feel smart. Like, oh, I've no, I've thought that my whole life. I thought I, you know, <laughs> you're just saying it in a way that makes sense, right? Like, yeah. I, one person's like that. I think it was Jordan Peterson. He says yeah. things, and I'm like, I've been thinking that my whole life, and never said it. And so yeah. I want to do that. What I want to say to people listening to this is like, you have everything you need. You don't need more training. That's kind of counterintuitive to what we're saying here. Yeah. Even though, like the example I gave where I said I realized I didn't really know GD&T, the last thing I needed was another GD&T training. I took all the GD&T trainings. Yeah. I needed to think. And I'm telling all the mechanical engineers yeah. out there that maybe you're hesitant, maybe you think you don't have enough training, enough whatever. You're a mechanical engineer. You have a degree. You've got the degree. Now go use it. Go think. Go think through these things. You don't need any more training unless you really do need to learn what GD&T is and all that. But I'm just trying to liberate you. Also, the leaders of companies listening to this, when they go, oh, my goodness, my guys are so inundated with training and programs. And uh, I don't know if I can throw another <laughs> thing at them. I don't you probably need one person in the group who's super passionate about this, about the mentorship model that can come alongside them and show them they actually have been thinking about it right. Because if you're a mechanical engineer, you think in 3D space all the time, you probably know more yeah. about GD&T than you think, than you realize. All you need is someone to connect those dots for you. And so you, yeah. if you're a leader of a company, of course you can hire me as a consultant, I can help lead that discussion. But connecting yeah. the dots of all, for all the things you've been thinking as a mechanical engineer, GD&T, the language of GD&T needs to be explained in a way that you go, oh, I knew that, and and there's a way to do that. So I was just trying to help liberate people from thinking they have to take more <laughs> training and be better, and that rat race of more certificates and qualifications. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I I really appreciate the insight there, man. And it is, it's it's actually a, a lot of us in a lot of areas, but specifically with engineering, it's not about learning more like things to add to your IQ, like more informational things. Like you're saying, Jonathan, it's more about thinking about it and and, and connecting those dots yes. in conversation with a mentor Yes. where the, the mentor knows just to give you a breadth of space and then things will start clicking as yes. you're sitting there and you start processing through the conversation and they'll have a discovery, th- their own discovery, their own breakthrough, I would call it, like you did with GD&T where you knew all of the the rules for a long time. And then that day came where I get GD&T now. It's not, I know the rules. I actually, I get it to a fundamental yes. deep level. Yeah, I don't have to remember it was not any another training. anymore. Yeah. I actually knew this stuff from a long time ago. I just, no one connected the dots. So that's what yeah. I'm trying to do is help, even like at the top level with leaders and companies, help them connect the dots with, what their engineers should be doing. I tell engineers in my training session, no one's going to tell you, like when we're going to the details of technical stuff, I stop and I, along the way, I say, by the way, no one's going to tell you in your company you should be doing this. I'm here today to tell you (laughs) you should be doing this. (laughs) This is going to make your company a lot of money. It's about being a professional mechanical engineer versus just checking off another box. Yes. Um, 
you could say that about leaders, you could say that about machinists, you could say that about a lot of different professions, just being a professional at what you do and being the best you can do, not because you're told you have to, but because it's what's necessary to be excellent and to push to that that high, high level. Yeah, another soundbite I would give leaders, probably the most technical soundbite, and it's not that technical. I'm just saying this is the most technical I'll give you, is your engineering teams should be looking to maximize tolerance for the minimum performance. Slow that down for a second. You're going to find out, your your engineering teams are going to find out what is the largest tolerance I can put on something with the, that will produce the minimum acceptable performance. In industry, we have that backwards. A lot of people have that backwards. We minimize tolerance to produce a maximum. We we're always focused on what's the best performance we can get out of this thing. And that is dollar signs all over the place. So if leaders can think about that when they're talking to their management teams, I think that'll go a long way. I agree. And your machinists, if you've got machinists, they will thank you for switching that mindset. Well, that's where the money comes from. That's where... (laughs) That's yes, that's where you're saving all your money, right? Because as yeah. a machinist, you're going to look at these prints and you're going to be like, oh, I can hit this all day long. And then you're, yeah. the engineer did all the hard work to verify the minimum performance is met at this at these maximum tolerance conditions. And then anything below that's even better. Well, yeah, because then we can save money on tooling. We can save money by reducing our scrap rate. We can save money by reducing our rework work rate. All the different wastes that that we were talking about in the beginning, we can we can eliminate those by 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 a large percentage yes um of course the devil's yeah. in the details you really need an expert to know yeah. how to do that process and and because you can lie and say and we lie to ourselves all the time you know um, yeah. one way we lie to ourselves as an engineer is i don't need to do a free body diagram i did that in school any mechanical engineer <laughs> listening to me right now probably is thinking that and i would say you're right in one regard but where you're wrong is when you start throwing variation in. If you were to do a free body diagram across variation, you realize uh, the free body diagram gets a lot uh, more complex and you do actually need to plot it all out. <laughs> yeah, and if they go through all the work, like yourself, maybe they'll find themselves owning a patent or two, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have no doubt you'll get patents after patents if you follow the process I laid out. Awesome. Well, this has been a great conversation, Jonathan. Is there anything else you wanted to contribute before we sign off? If anyone listening to this, you can get a hold of me on LinkedIn, direct message me. I'm very active on there. I'm a preacher of GD&T, a preacher of everything, you know, physics and plotting the variation with mechanisms. But more importantly, I'm, a, I'm passionate about mentorship and helping the next generation. If you're a young, the next generation coming to the workforce, hit me up and uh, we can talk. My services are for hire, but I always talk to people online just to get them going, so. That's fantastic, Jonathan. And I'll put links to the socials that you want linked down down below so people can just click. They don't have to worry about misspelling anything or typing anything up. They just click and follow. So thank you everyone for watching. I hope you got great value out of this conversation like I did sitting here with Jonathan today. And until next time, keep your spindles turning and earning.